Wow, thank you. <clears throat> you are blessed to have a couple of, well, probably more, but two really excellent musicians here. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is what uh, the music that we just heard. My name is Mark Stevenson. Welcome to East Martin Christian Reformed Church. My wife Bev and I live in Zeeland. I retired last June, and I'm very pleased to be able to be here this morning and appreciate your invitation to come. I've known Pastor Dave and Patrice for many, many years, and it's a delight to be here. We are beginning what we call Holy Week. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul talks about what is most important we can get so distracted by all kinds of things. Most of us are carrying one of these around that are shouting at us all day long and giving us notifications. And there's all kinds of other things trying to get our attention. And he said, here's what's most important. Above anything and everything else, you can read this right at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, what's most important, that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. So today, Palm Sunday, we move into that celebration of what is absolutely most important for us as people of God. So we sing now in celebration, Hosanna to the one who brings about our salvation and is bringing about the whole renewal of the earth. I invite you to rise and we'll sing together uh, number 296. blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God and Father, thank you so much that you welcome us into your presence. What an amazing thing that we can come to you at any time, and now, Lord, to gather with your people, to sing your praises, to confess our sins, and to know that we are renewed through our Lord Jesus Christ, and to hear your word. Guide us now as we worship you, and guide us through this week that we may live well for you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. God has greeted us and welcomed us. I invite you now to greet each other. We continue singing, praising our God, all glory, laud, and honor, and then we'll sing, we will glorify number 300 and then 301 in the songbooks.
may be seated. Before we hear the Ten Commandments, one of God's guides for us for living, I'd like to take a few moments to pray. We know that through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven according to the scriptures. And it's good for us to stop and say, God, I'm sorry. Not so that we can be forgiven, because once we're in Christ, we are forgiven but so that we can remember again what an amazing and gracious gift we have been given in forgiveness, and then to think about how can I live my life gratefully to God. So let's pray. God and Father, we, we are thankful for the new life we have in Jesus Christ. And God, we come to you now to confess our sins because we know, Lord, that we have fallen short this week. We have taken advantage of you. We have not been always kind to others. We have left undone things that we should have done and done things that we should not have done. And in and of ourselves, God, there's no health in us, but in you, we have new life. And so God, help us today, this week, throughout our lives to live well for you to dedicate our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to loving you and to loving neighbor. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. And Jesus told us that the greatest of all commandments is to love God above all and to love neighbor as self as the second. And the Ten Commandments are one way that we can live out that love for God and neighbor. So God said in Exodus 20, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, excuse me, or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children to the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of uh, those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, manservant or maidservant, the animals nor alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But God rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. As we prepare for our time of prayer this morning, I'm wondering if there are particular thanksgivings or requests you'd like me to make sure to mention in prayer. I received that uh, list, it's quite a long list, uh, and certainly I, I hope you take that home and use that as part of your guide for prayers this week. But is there anything you'd like to highlight or make sure we mention? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes. Thank you, 
Yeah, there have been deaths, haven't there? That's what I thought. And a lot of property damage, homes destroyed. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I saw that. That's exciting. Are, are you here this morning, Trey? Oh, Ava? Yeah, Ava. David, Justin, Violet? Some of you are here. Okay. Yeah, wow, that's exciting. I know um, for me as a pastor, it's one of the best things that happens in the course of a church year. So I'm excited for, for your family, for your whole congregation. Yes. Mm. for the week, and Rosalind uh, is the rep in our prayer uh, page, too. She was also uh, on a mission trip in uh, Mississippi. Okay, so people on mission trips. Okay, all right, thanks. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray. God, we do glorify you. We are thankful, Lord, for this week, for this season of Lent, for this time of lament for our sins, for lament for all the ways that we human beings have made a mess of things. And God, not only that, but a time of hope when we know that even though we have sinned, even though we have sinned as individuals collectively, that you are making all things new. And so God, as we pray in all things, we know God that you are working and making all things new. And so Lord, we ask that you will give your grace to those who are traveling and give safety, not only for spring break, but, but people on mission trips. Bless those who are away, that they can have a time of refreshment, those who are on mission trips, that they can be faithful in serving you and touched by, uh, touched by and touching others with your grace and love. We ask God that for your blessing on Doug DeMann and guidance, for Pastor Dave and Patrice, for the whole council, give your wisdom. Thank you, God, for Trey and Ava, David, Justin, Violet, Rilima, in the profession of faith. We praise you, God, that these people have decided to take a stand, to say, yes, I want to live my whole life for Jesus. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for East Martin Christian School. And we ask God for wisdom as the society makes decisions about budget and leadership. Bless the children and staff, parents and guardians. And give your blessing on all these children and young people as they learn and grow in knowing you and loving you. We ask God for your grace for people who have been hurt and harmed by storms, homes lost, people injured, and some mourning the loss of loved ones. Please, Lord, be with our missionaries and hold them in your love, all those that uh, are serving you nearby and far away. And God, as we pray for missionaries, help us to remember that each of us is to give testimony to your love by our actions and in our words. So help us, God, each of us to be missionaries. And now, Lord, as we give of our offerings, we pray that you will help us, God, to give with cheerful hearts, and that you will bless the ministries of our congregation and of our denomination as we give for the general fund and for ministry shares. Thank you so much, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the deacons to come forward now to receive our offering.
Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 19. And uh, if you have your Bibles open, I just wanted to highlight uh, a little bit of the context of this passage. So often when we come to church on Sundays, we just hear one uh, passage read. And it's good for us to remember uh, that throughout Scripture, the context is also important. And for the writers of the Gospels especially, the placement of the different sections is a way of expressing and bringing meaning to other sections right near it. So we're going to start reading from Luke 19 with verse 28. But if you look back to chapter 18, you'll see there a section, at least in the NIV, called Jesus again predicts his death. So we have this sense that the triumphal entry is not just about a ride on a donkey into the big city, but it's about a movement toward Jesus' death. Jesus' whole life, in fact, was a setting in motion, his death, but especially these events of this final week, and with, in particular with the, with the riding on the, on the donkey's colt, and we'll, we'll look more deeply into that as we, uh, in the message, but this was the big event that moved toward his crucifixion and that led to others saying, this man has to die. So he predicts his death, and then a blind beggar receives his sight, so some see properly and some do not. And then Zacchaeus, one who sees properly, the parable of the ten minas, about those who are faithful and those who are unfaithful, and then we have the triumphal entry, and then immediately after that, Jesus asserts his authority, and he cleanses the temple, where all kinds of things that were inappropriate were happening, and then the authorities question, uh, question Jesus, whether he has the authority to do this, and there's that moving toward his death of the uh, religious leaders saying, this man has to die. So this is set in that context, really, of Jesus' death, and that's so important for us to remember as we hear these words of, uh, of what Jesus did that, that Sunday morning. So I read for you uh, Luke 19, starting with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, that is the parable of the ten minas, after Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples joined, uh, began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And this is the word of the Lord. So 
Friends of Jesus, on Palm Sunday, or what we call Palm Sunday, Jesus put a stake in the ground. On Palm Sunday, Jesus drew a line in the sand as a way of saying, you can come on this side of the line and stand with me, or you can stand on the other side of the line and you will be against me. To us, it just looks like this ride on, a, on an animal into Jerusalem. But Jesus knew, his disciples knew, and the Jewish leaders all knew that Jesus was making a claim here, a claim of authority. And not just any kind of authority, but authority as the king, as the ruler. The triumphal entry was Jesus' way of claiming his kingdom. Jerusalem was the capital city of Israel. That's where the political leaders lived and ruled. Jesus knew that if he wanted to have a showdown, that was the place to do it. And he knew that if he was going to announce himself as coming king, that was the place to do it. No person campaigning to be president of the United States ever came to East Martin to announce his presidency, to announce his campaign for the presidency of the United States. He or she always chooses big cities, places of great uh, symbolism that many others would know about. It's not saying anything against East Martin, it's just the way things are. Jesus' ministry showed a clear movement from Galilee which is the backwater, in the beginning to Jerusalem at the end of his life. The book of Luke has 24 chapters, and already in chapter 9, the gospel highlights this focus, this movement of Jesus' ministry. In Luke 9, verse 52, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, between that resolute start, where we see in Luke 9, till the time when Jesus was crucified and rose again, there was a number of things that happened, teaching, miracles. Jesus chose his entry here as part of that movement, as a way of saying, this is my coronation as king. So let's see how Jesus did that and why this is so important. He chose to ride into the city of Jerusalem on a colt. Jerusalem, of course, uh, was looked to by the Jewish people for centuries as its capital city. So very significant, of course. But what about the colt and these other details? Well, Luke skips over large portions of Jesus' life, but here he devotes quite a bit of, quite a few words anyway, to a donkey. Now why is that? There's something going on here besides the disciples heading over to Obadiah's rent-a-donkey to get a donkey for Jesus to ride. Or maybe uh, they went to Yu He Hall. <laughs> I know, it's a bad joke. But the point is that, that donkey rental was a fairly common practice in those days, in the same way that there are rental car companies today, there were animal rental uh, companies in that day. And so likely that's where they went. And Jesus had special instructions for them to get an animal for him. A colt of a donkey, tied up, and when the disciples went to pick it up, all they had to say was, the Lord needs it. So let's look at those three in a little bit of detail. First of all, a donkey colt. This was part of fulfillment of scripture, Zechariah 9, verse 9. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. The donkey, second, was tied up. 
Genesis 49, verses 10 and 11. Again, we see with that tied up donkey, another fulfillment of scripture. Jacob gives his blessing to his son Judah. And of course, Jesus was from the line of Judah. Part of that blessing from Jacob includes words about one of his descendants who would be a great king, that he will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. The colt was tied up, just like in Jacob's blessing to Judah. And Luke drives the point home by using the words tie and untie five times in these few verses. And we may think riding on a donkey colt shows Jesus low standing, but actually it's just the opposite. <clears throat> just as a scepter and a crown were symbols of a king, so also riding on a donkey's colt was a symbol of a king. That's exactly what King Solomon did when he ascended to the throne in Jerusalem a thousand years before Jesus. He rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. And third, Jesus' instructions were that if someone asked, why are you untying it? Just say, the Lord needs it. So the point of this instruction is that Jesus' reputation and authority in the area were so well known that all that had to be said at Obadiah's rented donkey was, the Lord needs it. And the owner would just say, oh, Oh, of course, let him take it, as long as you need. A colt on which no one had ridden, tied up, the Lord needs it. These preparations said Jesus has authority. He is the king promised in scripture. Luke drives the point home further that Jesus is announcing that he is king. In verse 35, it says that the disciples put Jesus on the colt. Same thing as I was saying just a moment ago, that that's what happened with King Solomon as well. First Kings 1, verses 33 and 34. The people did the same thing for King Solomon when he rode into Jerusalem. And what's more, the people spread out their cloaks on the ground for the donkey to trample on them. And it was a way of the people saying, not just my coat, but my whole life is the king's, and I offer my life to him. People did the same thing for Jehu when he was crowned king of Israel. You can read about that in 2 Kings 9. And there's still more. The other gospel writers, when they describe this event of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, they quote Psalm 118, verse 26, exactly. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But in Luke, he paraphrases that slightly to bring home the point where you see here uh, in verse, uh, Luke 19, verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's still more. If you notice the title of my message, which is uh, Christmas on Palm Sunday, you may have wondered why I title it that. Here's why. As Luke was sitting one day writing his gospel for his friend Theophilus, we can expect that suddenly the similarity between uh, two different quotes really struck home for him from Christmas and Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, the crowd sh shouted, and that's also uh, 19, Luke 19, verse 38, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hmm. That sound familiar? Of course. We heard uh, another crowd, a crowd of angels, at Jesus' birth, shouting, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom God's favor rests. So Luke's point, he wants us to see this connection between Christmas and Palm Sunday. In both, he wants us to see that Christ is king. The king's servants, the angels, announce his birth. 
The king's servants, the disciples, announce his coronation. He's called the Lord at his birth, and when he needs a colt, all the disciples have to say is, the Lord needs it. At his birth and at his coronation, his servants used a phrase that was common in that day to express joy with the coming of a new king, glory in the highest. At his birth, and again here on Palm Sunday, at his coronation, his servants proclaim peace. But here we find another difference between Christmas and Palm Sunday. At Christmas, they proclaim peace on earth, and here on Palm Sunday, peace in heaven. A Bible commentator said about this difference, there can be no peace on earth that does not result from peace in heaven. It is when there is peace with God that humans find peace on earth. So when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on this colt, he draws a line in the sand. He puts a stake in the ground, and those who stand with him find peace. So, of course, that leads to the question, where do I stand? Where do we stand? Some choose uh, and we, and we see even in the scripture people who make different choices. And part of the challenge, of course, in that day and still today is it's not at all obvious that Christ is king. Bev and I have watched uh, that TV series, The Chosen, and uh, the they highlight in that series, and of course highlight what is already in scripture, the disciples keep wanting Jesus to announce that he is going to bring about overthrow of the Romans and the oppression of the Romans. That's the kind of king they want. And he doesn't do it. It's not obvious that Jesus is king. The Romans... As they watch Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, well, we can only guess what they thought, but I think we can make a, an educated guess, not too far a stretch, that Jerusalem was ruled by the Romans. Pilate was there in his court. They had the centurions and soldiers and the power of the sword and military might. They were enamored by their own strength and power. What would they have thought as they watched this man right into Jerusalem on a donkey? They may have said with laughter, <laughs> a procession of old clothes thrown on the ground, a young man riding on a donkey. What a naive lot, these Jews. They cheer and hoot over a man riding on a donkey. Likely, they felt disdain. How about the Hebrew rulers? What might they have said? Well, of course, we have an account of the Pharisees, but what about the most powerful rulers, Caiaphas and the others, uh, who was the high priest at that time? The Romans would not have known uh, about the scripture passage in Zechariah 9, verse 9, that I quoted earlier. But Caiaphas and the religious rulers would have known they would have known that, of course, Solomon rode on a donkey's colt. They would have known about Jehu and that the people threw their cloaks in the ground before him. They would have known all that. And they would have been appalled to see this man, Jesus, claiming, taking for himself this kind of authority. They would have been angered by what they would see as him blaspheming scripture. And of course, that's exactly what Jesus intended to set in motion was this anger resulting only five days later in his death. So these are examples of 
choosing to reject Jesus, to stand on the other line of the, in the sand from Jesus, to write him off as a fool, or write him off as a threat to your own security. Jesus' own words in Luke 19, verse 42, weeping over Jerusalem, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. That was the response also of Herod at Jesus' birth. Not only did Herod reject Jesus, but he tried even to have Jesus killed at that time. When Jesus drew that line in the sand on Palm Sunday, many people sadly said, no, I'm going to stand against you, Jesus. And it's tempting for us to be harsh in our judgment toward people who reject Jesus, but we need to remember, of course, that Jesus had no special features to draw people to himself, no beauty or majesty that others should choose to desire him. He looked like any other man, and it takes a special gift, an opening of the eyes to see him properly. So Jesus drew a line in the sand. Some stand with, some stand against. I think the biggest temptation for us is to want to put one foot on each side. There are people, and I think it's true of all of us, that we do things to a certain extent. We give to charity to a certain extent. We exercise to a certain extent. We keep up with the news to a certain extent. We take time for our children to a certain extent. We live our lives for Jesus to a certain extent. We accommodate Jesus, allowing Jesus a place in our lives that we can control. We want to stand with him, yes. It's good because we have family and friends who do. Maybe it's the way that we were raised. But there's part of us that wants to have our own thing. We want to have Jesus to have a place in our lives that we can control. That's the response embodied by the Pharisees in verses 39 and 40. I think that the Pharisees were there because they had some favor toward Jesus, otherwise they wouldn't have been there at all. But they just don't want to be so committed. They get upset with Jesus. Quiet these disciples down. They're making too much noise. They only want to observe and honor Jesus to a certain extent. Now, I mentioned that the context of Scripture, especially in the Gospels, helps give meaning to other passages near it. So, right before this passage of the triumphal entry is the parable of the ten minus. In a quick summary, a uh, man who has a lot of money gives some money to one servant, some money to another servant, some money to another servant, goes off on a mission. When he comes back, some have taken the money, worked hard, invested it, but there's the one that's called the wicked servant. The wicked servant honored his master to a certain extent. He took the money, kept it, hid it, didn't do any work at all. And then when the master came back, he said, well, here's the money you gave me to take care of. And the master was upset with him because he only accommodated. He only lived for the master to a certain extent. And that strikes closer to home. Because for all of us, to live fully for Jesus is a risk. For all of us, there are times in our lives where we say, Jesus, don't ask me to do too much. I'm afraid I can't. I want to live my life quietly. I'm comfortable with my life, and life has enough trouble already without my being all in with you. Let me go to church and raise my family and have my devotions before I go to bed. But Jesus, don't ask more of me than that. I don't know about you, but I've certainly felt that at many times in my life. 
when Jesus draws a line in the sand, this response firmly plants one foot on each side. But of course, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. Ultimately, Jesus says, you can't just accommodate me. You can't just live for me to a certain extent. You need to fully devote yourself to me and follow me completely. There's a line in the sand, and you need to choose to be on the side of the line with me. And that's a choice to embrace him. So once again, looking back to chapter 18, you see uh, Jesus predicting his death and then the blind beggar receiving his sight. Matthew and Mark describe that healing of the man who was blind and received his sight happening immediately before the triumphal entry. And that isn't there just by chance. It's a way of reminding all of us that true spiritual vision sees Jesus for who he is. The blind man calls Jesus the son of David, which is another way of saying he is the Messiah, the king. Though this man is blind, he has true spiritual vision, and then Jesus gives him physical sight too. Unlike Matthew and Mark, Luke adds a couple of other events in between. There's Zacchaeus, a reject, a sinner who wants to see Jesus, it says in 19 verse 3. And he does, and in turn, he devotes his whole life and soul, he's all in with Jesus. He says, I'll give back anything I stole. I am fully for you, Jesus. And the good servants in the parable of the ten minas. They embrace their master's mission fully and work hard at it with all their heart. And then the crowds around Jesus at the triumphal entry, they praise God in loud voices for all the miracles he has done, for the miracles they have, 19 verse 37, the miracles they have seen, they see with true spiritual vision. Do you want to embrace Jesus? Do you want to live fully for him? Then we need to be capable of seeing Jesus beyond ordinary, everyday life. We need to see with true spiritual vision. We need eyes that see a baby lying in a feeding trough in a stable as our Savior. We need eyes to see that a man riding on a donkey is the king of heaven and earth and king of our souls. Even though often he doesn't do what we want him to do. Even though we cannot control him, but he controls us. We need eyes to see that going to work and going to school and eating supper and going to the hospital, everything else we do is done in the presence of God. We need eyes to see that every event of our lives is touched by the hand of God. We need eyes to see that the Savior has come. He invites you to live your life all in for him. So the question for you and for me, again, is, am I truly all in for Jesus? So I invite us to join the lead or follow the lead of the blind man. When he saw Jesus, well, <clears throat> when he knew it was Jesus before him, he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So I invite us together to say that out loud. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I know I kind of sprung that on you, so let's say it together again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. One more time. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. From the heart. From the heart. And Jesus then responds. This is a really interesting question. He says to the blind beggar, what 
do you want me to do for you? And the, the beggar's answer is, well, Lord, I want to see. But the context we realize is not just physical sight, but it's that spiritual vision. So I invite you also to respond as the blind man. When Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Your answer is, Lord, I want to see. And again, I sprung it on you, so here you go again. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. One more time, right deep from the heart. What do you want me to do for you, Ask Jesus. Lord, I want to see. And Jesus will surely answer, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And Jesus will give us eyes to see. Let's pray. Jesus' everyday life, <clears throat> there's all kinds of things pulling at us. All kinds of voices saying, I'm most important. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to that. And in all that fog, Lord, it can be hard to see you. So clarify our vision. Open our hearts that we may see you fully. See you as king of heaven and earth, king of all humankind, king of our souls. So God, give us faith, teach us, guide us, lift us up, and bring us along with you in your mission here on earth today, this week, and through the rest of our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit, and we'll sing together. Receive God's blessing now, and immediately after, we'll sing another, uh, just one verse of praise. All hail the power of Jesus' name. From our hearts, he is king. This is from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you. Let me say that again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.